Hey there guys, what I have right here in front of me is actually the boss game P3, a mini PC that is rocking the Ryzen 9 6900HX. What I want to see is how this chip does in 2024 when it comes to playing games because RDNA 2 is really the cheapest way to get into a gaming mini PC that actually still has proper driver support. This is a pretty big deal that separates this from all the Vega based mini PCs. Think computers that are rocking the Ryzen 5 5500U all the way up to to the 5800H. All of these have integrated graphics that are running on the Vega architecture, which is a architecture that AMD has at this point effectively abandoned outside of just security patches. So what that means is that if you want a chip that is actually getting games optimized for it, you have to go with RDNA 2. And this is one of the cheapest ways to get into RDNA 2 while also getting decent performance, at least in theory. See, the chip in here, the 6900HX is rocking 8 Zen three plus cores. So not that different from the 5800H, but where it actually differs is the fact that it has 12 RDNA two cores in the 680M iGPU. On the 6900HX, the 680M can clock all the way up to 2400 megahertz. It really just depends on how much TDP it has available to it and if it can keep itself cool. Combine that with 32 gigabytes of DDR5 memory running at 4800 megahertz and a one terabyte SSD, and you have a pretty decent computer here. But of course, when we compare it to what exists as the top end right now, something like the 78 40 HS, it falls behind not only on the CPU side because there was actually an IPC increase there, but it also falls behind with the GPU. But how much does that really matter? Could we actually sit down and use this system effectively in 2024? So we're going to jump into some modern games as well as some older games just to see where this scales in comparison to other systems. So let's jump right on in. So the first game I wanted to take a look at is Helldivers 2. I know that the game has lost a lot of its player base. I don't really care. I really like this game. And I was really curious to see if this system could actually handle it properly. Here you see it running with the lowest in-game graphics settings, and we are using FSR at the balanced preset. If you've seen any of the videos that I've seen recently with the 7940HS, these are the exact same settings that I used in that system. Unfortunately, this system really seems to be struggling to keep up here. Specifically, what seems to be suffering is those 1% lows that make this a very inconsistent gaming experience. The TDP here was locked at 45 watts, which is what the system defaults to out of the box. And as you can see, at 45 watts, it's just not enough to fully feed the GPU and the CPU. And even then, the temperatures are still getting pretty high up there because the system itself does not have a very aggressive fan setting. So the system itself is not very loud, but it's also kind of struggling to keep the system cool at a 45 watt TDP. I did unlock the TDP TDP and raise it to its performance preset that you can change it to in the BIOS. That seems to set a target TDP of around 55 watts. It really seems to hover around that area while using it, but it really didn't affect the performance at all in Helldivers 2. So if I were you and you were actually looking to play the game on a system like this, I would just keep it at the 45 watt TDP. Though this is a title where you're going to have to lower the FSR setting down to performance and it really gets brutal at that point. So already we're off to a pretty rough start. So after setting the TDP to a higher setting, I did also run Dying Light 2's built-in benchmark. Here you see it running with the lowest in-game graphics settings, and we are using FSR at the performance preset, and the performance isn't incredible. While the FPS average is more than decent, the 1% lows leave a little bit to be desired there, but it's not an absolute disaster. I did also load it into the campaign I already had going on, since I've recently just been working my way through the game, and from what I played of it, there were definitely stutters here and there, but depending on the areas that you were at, the performance would be better or worse. In very populated areas, it can definitely become kind of a problem, but when you're roaming around the open world, a lot of the times I didn't really run into too many issues, but it is one of those things where I could see the frustration coming in when those 1% lows start to be a problem. So the next game that I took a look at is Ghost of Tsushima which is actually a title that runs really well on PC, considering that it is a port of a relatively older console game. Not exactly the latest and greatest in terms of tech, but it's still a great looking game and it plays really, really well on here. In fact, the level of performance that we got on here is not that dissimilar from what we were getting with the 780M iGPU. In fact, for the most part, it was practically identical and I was in the exact same area as I was before. So that was interesting to see, but I also did test it out with frame generation with the 7940HS. 
So let's see what frame generation does with the 6900HX. And once we turn on the FSR frame generation, we do actually end up seeing a very nice improvement in our overall performance, but it wasn't as high as the improvement that we got with the 780M in the 7948HS system. But it also wasn't that far behind. And in general, both systems were giving a great experience in this title, and I had a very, very good time playing on here. It felt great. It looked great. It doesn't really show the same ghosting effects that I was seeing in other titles that have frame generation so overall this seems to be a pretty great implementation and considering the price difference between a system with a 680m and a 780m i'm surprised by just how similar they were in performance in this title so because the performance was so similar in ghost of tsushima especially with the frame generation also not falling that far behind i was very curious to try it out on spider-man miles morales so playing the game at the medium graphic settings with FSR set to the quality preset wasn't exactly a great experience on here. There was a lot of stutters. The 1% lows were really struggling. You can tell by the frame time chart that things were really falling apart. The FPS average would have been fine, but it's those 1% lows that are really dragging down the experience. So here you would actually have to turn things down from medium down to the lowest graphic settings or use FSR at a more aggressive setting if you'd like to get decent performance that is closer in line with what we were getting with the 780M. This one is showing a pretty distinct difference. Of course, the main reason I wanted to try this title was to try out frame generation since it did a really great job with the 780M. So let's see if that actually holds true with the 680M. And this is one of the things that really has sold me a lot on frame generation. The night and day difference in terms of playing this game with frame generation on and with it off is honestly staggering. While our 1% lows don't get to an incredible level, they're certainly vastly improved over where they were at before. And if you look at those frame time charts, they are so much smoother. Pair that with the increase in the FPS average, and this is a completely different gaming experience. I'll be honest, when I first heard about frame generation, it didn't really seem all that interesting to me because you are just making up frames that don't really exist. But trying it out on these mini PCs has really convinced me on just how great and revolutionary it is. Because in those scenarios where you are just at the edge of playability, like where we were at without it on, just flipping that switch makes this so much better to play that even the occasional ghosting that I end up seeing on Miles as he's swinging around and moving is nothing in comparison to the improvements in the overall playability of this. The update to Counter-Strike 2 really ended up breaking the performance on Vega-based iGPUs to the point where they're unplayable in this title at even the lowest in-game graphics settings, and he would have to use FSR to get any kind of playable experience, and at that point, visually speaking it looks so bad that there's no real reason to do it this is completely different when we switch on over to a rdna2 based igpu and this is one of the big things that i want to emphasize the fact that because this is the latest hardware because this is what's actually getting getting driver support there is actual optimization happening in these more recent titles because here counter strike 2 is not running with the lowest in-game graphics settings this is with the highest graphic settings at a level that most people will realistically never play this game at because you're trying to maximize your FPS. But I set it to this because it's also what I tested it on on the 7940HS and both of them gave such great results that it's clear that the big issue here is the lack of optimization being done for Vega. And whether that's a failing on Valve's part or if it's a failing on AMD's part, it doesn't really matter. The point is the game just does not play well with those older iGPUs and I don't think there's going to be a fix for that anytime soon or ever for that matter. Maybe if you game on Linux, the experience is different, but at least if you're a Windows user, when it comes to driver optimization, you are completely out of luck if you're still stuck on Vega. Now, if we try out Guardians of the Galaxy with the lowest in-game graphics settings and FSR set to the ultra quality setting, well, we start to see also a noticeable difference between the performance in this and what we got with the 780M. Our 1% lows in particular are kind of struggling here, but the FPS average is also noticeably different where the 780M was able to get a 60 FPS average. Here, we're looking at more like a 45. This is unfortunate to see, and it does mean that you're, you're probably going to have to mess around with 
with FSR settings if you want to get closer to 60, though this might just be playable enough for a lot of people considering that it is a single player game. And the last game I want to take a look at is Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord here running with the medium in-game graphics settings. And medium already gives you the vast majority of the visual quality improvements. And it's kind of just diminishing returns once you go to high, very high, and like the ultra graphic settings. So this is really a great baseline for trying to play the game. And fortunately, we do get a pretty great result here. It's very playable. It's very decent. The 1% lows are at a reasonable level, though it is falling behind in terms of FPS average and 1% lows in comparison to the 780M. It's really not all that far off from what we were at, though. Don't get me wrong. The performance uplift of the 780M is definitely going to be noticeable in the larger combat sections. But as someone that played Mountain Blade, the original and Warband, this is well within the playable territory of this fan base. Trust me, there was a lot of us that were probably playing those games at half the FPS of this, just due to how poorly optimized they were for modern hardware. So what exactly can we draw as a conclusion after looking at those results for this specific system? If we jump on over to Amazon here, we can take a look at some of the systems that are rocking the 6900HS and we'll take a look at systems running the 7840HS. I know I tested the 7940HS recently and that was really the main point of comparison that I kept bringing up, but for pretty much everyone, you are better off getting the 7840HS instead of the 7940HS because they are identical and that extra overclock does not mean anything. But when we look at the 6900HX in terms of the systems that are available, there are certainly some pretty great prices to be found, though a lot of these systems come with 16 gigabytes of RAM and I'm personally just not a fan of that. I think that these systems really benefit from 32 gigabytes of RAM, especially if you want to do some gaming. A perfect example of a modern game that gives you problems with the amount of memory that you have available is actually the brand new title that's going to be coming out later this year, Marvel Rival. That game on a system with only 16 gigabytes of memory is already going to give you problems. Where things really get bad though is when it comes to these systems that are using the system memory as also video memory. Because while you can ignore the low RAM limit, because while you can ignore the low RAM warnings when you're on a desktop that has 16 gigabytes of RAM, but you have a graphics card that has its own dedicated video memory, because these 16 gigabytes have to be shared with the iGPU, what ends up happening is that that affects the amount of available RAM to the point where you will get crashes in a game like that with only 16 gigabytes of RAM. 32 is really the way to go. So if we look at the prices for 32 gigabyte systems, we're able to find some that are the below $400 price point, though you are looking at a smaller SSD. And if you want the 32 gigabytes of RAM and a one terabyte SSD, then you're looking at more like a sub $500 system. Still, there are some great prices to be had. And of course, there are coupons for a lot of these things. And here you can see we have the P3. I don't recommend the P3 as a gaming system, though. This is a system that was extremely optimized for low TDP usage because the fan noise on this thing is practically non-existent, but it's because they went with a very low RPM for that fan. And as a consequence, when you actually try to do high-end gaming on something like this, it starts to fall apart in terms of just temperature. So this is really just a great home server. The chip itself is still really, really efficient. It does a great job, especially at this price point. But as a gaming system, I don't really recommend it. If I was on the market right now for a system, I would more than likely pick up one of these two right here. Either the B-Link Sur 6 2024 edition or the UM690. But that's really if you're looking at getting the Ryzen 9 6900HX, which I just don't think it's worth it. And here's why. The 7735HHS is essentially the same thing as the 7840HS in the sense that the 7840HS is just a 7940HS with a slightly lower clock speed, and the 7735HS is just a 6900HX with a slightly lower clock speed. Because of that, when you're actually gaming, the performance difference is non-existent and the price savings that you can get here are pretty dramatic. If we wanted to get the 6900HX, we could get a 16 gigabyte system with 500 gigabytes of RAM for $350. But if we went with a 
135HS system, same exact thing, we can get 32 gigabytes of RAM. That memory upgrade is going to give you a better experience in Unreal 5 engine games than the extra couple hundred megahertz on both the CPU and the iGPU. This is the bigger deal here. And I think that this is the chip to get. But of course, prices are not set in stone and there will be times where you will actually find systems with the 6900HX on a great deal that actually makes it a better buy over this. It really just depends. You're gonna have to look around and see what you can find on the market at this exact moment. But if I were you, I would pretty much be looking at either one of these in terms of price and how does it stack up against the 7840HS? Well, we're looking at still a pretty decent markup for these specific systems in comparison to the older Zen 3 Plus based mini PCs. Of course, we did see that there are titles where this will actually push you over the edge of being above 60, but you are paying a little bit of a premium here. Long term, I think that this is a better play for you. You're spending just an extra couple hundred dollars at most and you get a system system that is noticeably more powerful, but we're talking about a 50% increase in price in some of these cases for what amounts to around a 25 to 30% increase in performance. Not exactly great value for the money, but if you want the best of the best in terms of an iGPU, this is pretty much it. Yeah, you can go with a 7940HS system if you actually want the best of the best, but the difference in terms of performance is realistically non-existent. And you'd be paying more money just for the Ryzen 9 label, which is kind of what happens with the 6900HX here. You're kind of just paying for that Ryzen 9 label and a small increase in megahertz. Of course, the price difference between the 6900HX and the 7735HS is much lower than some of these systems that have the 7940HS versus the 7840HS. I mean, just as an example, here taking a look at this, this is a 7840HS system from Boss Game. I don't know why it doesn't say that in the title, but that is Boss Game there, which just means it's made by the same company that makes the systems for B-Link. And that one is $510 for 32 gigabytes of RAM and a one terabyte SSD. Compare that to the Minis Forum UM790 Pro with the Ryzen 9 7940HS that with a $100 coupon comes out to be more around $430, but you have to bring your own SSD and RAM for it. And if you want to match the specs of this, you're effectively going to end up spending more than $510. And that's all just so you can have that Ryzen as a nine name. So it does seem like these RDNA 2 based systems, at least the ones with the 680M, do hold up pretty well in the market today. And of course, you do get the benefit of the added support of drivers, which is really the big benefit here. It's the fact that you are going to continue to get updates on your drivers that are going to make your gaming experience better. And in some cases, that is going to make the difference on whether a game is playable at all, as we've seen with Counter-Strike 2 and Vega iGPUs versus these RDNA based one. But I do have a system coming in with what is the lowest end RDNA 2 iGPU that you can get right now on the market, and it is one of the cheaper systems that I've seen. So stay tuned for that. Check out the links down below for these systems if you're interested in picking up something with this. I was thoroughly impressed with seeing how the 680M has been holding up. One of the biggest cruxes that it has is the fact that it's kind of stuck running at DDR5 4800 megahertz. But if you are going down the bare bones route, out, that does mean that that RAM speed is actually relatively cheap in comparison to most other RAM. That being said, the deals that you can get on complete kits are pretty great most of the time to the point where you don't really need to go down the bare bones route. So I hope you found this look at the 6900HX running on the P3 to be useful or interesting in any capacity. I definitely found it to be surprising just how well it's been holding up in 2024, though it definitely seems to be falling behind the 780M. It's going to be interesting to see what these newer generations of iGPUs that are coming out later this year are going to hold up. I'll catch you guys in the next one.